This podcast is made possible in part by Patreon support, and I'd like to say thank you to our newest patron, Nev. Thank you so, so much, Nev, for joining the Patreon. Uh, If you would like to be as absolutely wonderful, incredible, and amazing as Nev, then head on over to japankyo.com slash Patreon to sign up for as little as $1 a month. You can sign up for $3 a month and that'll give you access to Japanese Plus Alpha, a podcast that I do about the Japanese language. So whatever you sign up for, I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Once again, thank you so much, Nev. And with that, let's get to the show. <laughs> so he thinks Shoto Takatashi is like, one, 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 with him. Yeah, yeah. So it could be that Shoto Kutaishi was able to, one, 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 or that Yukimaru was able to, hey, Shoto Kutaishi, let me tell you something. So I, I, I'm not sure. I would like a treat sure. now. Please get me one. Yes. <laughs> Please pet my belly now. Welcome to Ichimon Japan. I'm Tony. And I'm Ryan. All right. So Ichimon means one question. And every episode we ask a question about Japan. Today's question is, what are Japan's most famous dogs? So Ryan, I've realized that um, a lot of our episodes have something to do with either animals or language. (laughs) I think like... A very high percentage of, of the content that I'm putting out. Always or curses. On That's our third category. <laughs> yeah. Animals, curses, language, or some intersection of those. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the dog curse of Japan and how it impacts grammar. Yeah, yeah. And the etymology of the curse phrases as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I like animals, I like language, so I guess that's the kind of stuff that I naturally gravitate towards. But, I'm fine with uh, both, too. Yeah, yeah. But occasionally we do talk about, um, what did we talk about? School rules. Yeah, and school white rules underwear. is different. Yeah, white underwear as well, yeah. We did do uh, internet curses and the curse of the kernel, though. So we need, we need to step up our curse game. <laughs> yeah, we need, we need to complete the curse trifecta there, so. I will look into another curse. <laughs> so, right. Some curse regarding animals that impacted language would be this. Hmm. It would be great okay. if we can find some kind of like kotowaza that's like based on an animal, but talking about a curse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like a kotowaza, like a parable, a phrase or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A saying. Yeah, an yeah, idiom, yeah. I guess. Yeah. All right. An idiom. Yeah, yeah. That's it. All right. So I will, I will look into anything like that so that we can... Uh, do the ultimate Ichimon Japan episode, but but anyway, today meantime, doggos. Yeah, yeah, today doggos exactly. So there's um. All right, so let let me explain the the background to this. Of course, when you think famous dogs, right, you think Hachiko, right? Famous yes. dogs in Japan, Hachiko, and yes, that is a very famous dog. Easily the most famous actual dog that lived at some point in Japan. Um, but. I didn't want to do content about Hachiko because it's such a well-known story. So I began by thinking, what other famous dogs are there? And then once I started looking into the story of Hachiko, I uncovered a few things that I think are not that well-known. So uh, I'm glad I ended up trying this out. But before we get to Hachiko, which will be in the second part of the episode, we're going to talk about a few other notable Japanese dogs. Are we going like a historical order or something? <laughs> um, You know what? I... I didn't do that on purpose, but it, let's see, is it? No, it's not actually in, in historical order. It's okay. Not. Okay. But we are starting with the uh, earliest of these uh, doggos. So uh, the first one is a, a little doggy by the name of Yukimaru. So Yukimaru is known as uh, Shotoku Taishi's Aiken, his beloved dog. Uh, Shotoku I think there's Taishi, even a word like Aiken. Yeah, I can. I is love, and then Ken is dog. A different pronunciation of the of kanji for dogs. And I thus, can. we brought language into it. <laughs> there you, well, there will be some language, especially at the end of the episode too. So, uh, language and animals, yay! Um, so, all right. So, yeah. So he's the Iken of Shotoku Taishi, the the beloved dog, the loyal dog. I, well, not anyway. Shotoku Taishi is this very he very was famous a loyal dog. All dogs are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a very famous uh, semi-legendary uh, prince uh, of, of Japanese history. So uh, I, his stuff is written about him in the Nihon Shogi. So that is, I, th- I think that's the oldest one, if not the second oldest uh, written records. I, I always get the, 
that one and the Nihongi confused, but they were written um, almost at the same time. Yeah. Like it was like the like, same people, but one was first and then they wrote the other one next. So it was like a 12 year difference or something. Like that. Yeah. It's, yeah. but again, it was the All same right. team of people. So yeah, you was, might as well uh, say they came out together. The same creative team. They were working on multiple. Um, <laughs> it was a creative team. They're not very historical. It was, <laughs> it was the Japan Cinematic Universe they were working on. <laughs> we should do an episode on the Japanese Cinematic Universe. <laughs> it all started with, you know, whatever the equivalent of Iron Man is. And then, you know. Tenmu? Um, I don't know. Robert Downey Jr. as Tenmu. Um, <laughs> okay, anyway. So, uh, when, let's see, when was Shotoku Taishi supposedly alive? Uh, supposedly from February 7th, f- uh, 574 through April 8th, 622. All right. So, at some point, uh, Prince uh, Shotoku Taishi, or whatever you want to call him, he had multiple names, but we're just going to call him Shotoku Taishi. Um, That's his most common he had, name. Yeah. He had the dog, Yukimaru. It was a, a white dog. Usually he's depicted as a white dog. Uh, s- smallish, it seems. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting abilities that this dog is said to have had. So in some uh, uh, instances that I saw written about Yukimaru, I saw that he could understand Buddhist chants. Um, and then in another instance, I also saw that he could chant, actually chant the Buddhist chants. <laughs> so that's pretty impressive. Um, and then other uh, another interesting thing that he was supposedly able to do was to uh, talk to Shotoku Taishi. So here it's a little ambiguous. Um, it said like uh, Shotoku Taishi to Hanasu or something like that. So be able to talk. So I'm not sure like who was talking the other's language. You know what I mean? <laughs> so he thinks Shotoku Taishi is like one, 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 one with him. Yeah, yeah. So it could be that Shotoku Taishi was able to one, 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 or that Yukimaru was able to, hey, Shotoku Taishi, let me tell you something. So <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure. I would like I'm a treat sure. now. Please get me one. Yes. <laughs> Please pet my belly now. Or, or, you know, the Yukimaru was just going one one one, and then Shoto Kutachi was able to understand the one 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 as more than one one one. These two scenarios are equally amazing. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> I, I this was not clear in my uh, extensive research of this, so I, I, I apologize. But apparently, Yukimaru and Shoto Kutachi could communicate. So there you go. Um, and so Yukimaru was just a very, you know, intelligent dog, apparently. And he would follow, uh, Shotoku Taishi as he did all his political stuff. And, uh, I guess, you know, he was able to learn about politics and Buddhism through that. So. And then he became <laughs> prime minister. <laughs> <laughs> Japan's first prime minister. Yeah. 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 Yukimaru Sori, as they would call him. So, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, but, uh, of course, like... Everywhere in Japan, uh, Nara Prefecture uh, ended up using uh, a, a mascot character based on uh, Yukimaru. Uh, and uh, so today there is a, a, a like one of these anthropomorphic Yukimaru style mascots. Uh, I found two uh, songs, uh, two theme songs for Yukimaru. I will post them in the links. They are super catchy. Um, is one in like lang- human language and one in dog language? <laughs> no, they're both human language. Uh, and they sing about all the amazing things that he can do. And, uh, and then also like dance moves. Like one of them is like, oh, he shakes his butt like an oshiri foodie foodie. <laughs> like, <you know>? so, <laughs> like and it's a bunch dog. of kids singing it. It's very cute. It's very cute. So I, I love that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, actually, I, I wrote an article about a drone version of Yukimaru that was created a few years ago. Uh, that got cited in a couple different websites, like back in, I don't know, 2017 or 2018. And it was like one of these quadcopter drones that looks like the illustrated version of Yukimaru uh, flying around Nara Prefecture. And it's this video where, where you can see that. It's very cute. So you can uh, also fly. Maybe, maybe, yeah. <laughs> he also had like helicopter blades coming out of him, apparently. So now that is one awesome doggo. Yeah, so I would say that of the dogs that we're talking about today, he probably isn't the most famous, unless you're in Nara Prefecture. But he is certainly, supposedly, the one that could do the most amazing things. I gotta so, say, I'm looking at a picture of the mascot now, and it is. Not the greatest picture. <laughs> Maybe it's the angle, 
But it looks uh, like he doesn't have a dog snout so much as they just like drew a face on a dog neck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I don't know if there's much uh much of a uh how can I put it? 3D depth to his face. I, I haven't noticed the profile. So I just found a picture of a float of him, I guess. Oh no, that's the drone. Okay, okay. Okay, 3D images of him look better than this drawing from the Nato's oh, okay, website. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, yeah, I thought I thought he looked cute. <laughs> I found a video of the drone. Its its paws move like it's walking as it flies. Oh <laughs> I didn't remember that. <laughs> it's cute, right? Yeah, it's just like flying by some elderly people sitting on the street and it has subtitles <laughs> being like, oh, look at these lovebirds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good video. Okay, this now might be my favorite mascot if they have a drone that just flies around visiting the townsfolk. <laughs> I hope they're still flying him around. <laughs> it's the daily Yukimaru flight and people just come out to watch it. All right, so that's Yuki Mario, number one. Let's move on to the next one. So now we're coming into much more uh, modern times. Um, and we're talking about Taro and Jiro. So this is a two for one. So these are two, um, uh, the English name would be Sakalin Huskies. Um, and in Japanese, they're called uh, Karafuto Ken. So uh, of the Karafuto breed, uh, Ken is like the suffix for a dog breed. Um, and, uh, they, uh, so this breed currently is either extinct or very much close to extinction. I, I, last I, I checked, there was like a report maybe in the mid 2010s and I think there was like one left. So, <laughs> um, it's probably not around anymore. Um, but this, this breed, it's called the Sacklin Husky because, um, there's an island to the north of, uh, Sap, uh, Hokkaido, and I believe that that place is called Sakhalin. So, um, it, I guess it was bred there, and it also is in was in Japan. But um, basically, it's these, you know, like a husky, right? It's a, a a a type of working dog that is very well suited for the cold. And there were two of them. <laughs> I like the way you called a working dog. Like Yuki Mato, he was a white collar dog. But Taro he was, Jiro, they he were blue collar dogs. <laughs> he was an aristocrat. He was, you know, joining in political meetings and chanting Buddhist sutras. So yeah, he was very much a, a noble. Yeah, Taro and Jiro, they were much more down to earth. They didn't have time for that fancy spanchy they, oh, political yeah, yeah. stuff. And definitely. And they had a they had a hard life. They had a hard working life. So uh, so the story goes that uh, in January of 1957, there was a Japanese expedition to the South Pole. And uh, they took with them 15 of these Sakhalin Huskies. Uh, again, working dogs, sleigh dogs. Uh, but as I think it was around the time that they were supposed to switch out with the second team uh, that was coming in February of the following year, 1958, uh, there was a really, really uh, bad weather going on. And so they had to evacuate all of a sudden. And so they came to rescue the team, but uh, they couldn't take the dogs with them. I, I, I'm just assuming there wasn't space in the, it might have been a helicopter. I think it, it might have been a helicopter, but I'm not sure. But anyway, so they came to rescue them. They couldn't take the dogs with them. And for some reason, they, well, no, they left them chained uh, because they figured they'd be coming back in a few days. Uh, but they were unable to come back because I guess the weather didn't clear. So these 15 Sakhalin Huskies were stuck, chained with a little bit of food for maybe a few days. Uh, and, uh, they were just left there and they were left there for 11 months. And, um, eventually they, they decide to go back to rescue the dogs. Um, and, uh, 11 months later, they end up finding, that seven of the 15 died while still chained, right? And uh, then there were six that went missing. They managed to get out of their uh, chains and they just disappeared. And then near the base, they ended up finding Taro and Jiro, which were two of the huskies, uh, and they were okay. And uh, there, there's like pictures of them and they, they were they were. They managed to survive somehow. Nobody knows exactly how they managed to survive, uh, but it's speculated that they were eating penguins, um, maybe seals, or maybe feces of seals. 
uh, maybe fish that were trapped in ice. Um, and and I, there's no records that showed that they had eaten their uh, deceased, you know, other working dogs, the, the ones that had died chained. So, um, but they managed to survive and it was a big, big deal in the news. And uh, one of them stayed at the South Pole working for a while longer, I think uh, passed away in 1960. And the other one passed away in 1970 in Japan, uh, living the rest of its life at Hokkaido University, if I remember correctly. So uh, after that, they got um, taxidermied. They, they skinned them and, and put them on display. Uh, one is in the uh, National Science Museum in Tokyo, and the other one is uh, also in Hokkaido. So, um, and then in 1983, they made a movie which was extremely popular. It was called uh, Nankyoku Monogatari, uh, literally South Pole Story, but in English it's called Antarctica. And it was a very ambitious film uh, that depicted that whole story. And apparently, a significant portion of the movie is just like the movie follows. Taro and Jiro as they try to survive and there's like no dialogue it's just like two dogs living in in like snowy conditions and it, but it was very very popular and I, I think I, I heard somewhere that that also helped push like a big boom in the 80s for these animal movies that that became popular in Japan like I think Milo and Otis if anybody remembers that was one of these movies that got adapted into English but was originally in Japan so um, yeah it was a very popular big deal you can understand why this kind of story of dogs surviving uh, would catch on but uh, yeah Taro and Jiro you probably can still go see them. They're, they're still on display. So What good doggos. I bet they could also understand uh, Buddhist sutras. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you're in the snow. You got you to gotta do something to occupy your time, right? Yeah. You can't just make all your day eating seal poop. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But I'm happy they, they made it out okay. Uh, moving on, we have one more. And this is the only one that I specifically listed that is not a real actual dog. I just want to throw this one in here just for the hell of it because I, I enjoy this kind of silly stuff. Um, and he is a mascot character that was created in 2001. And his name is Afro Ken. Uh, so, Ryan, had you ever seen Afro Ken? I have not until like this episode. <laughs> well, can you describe Afro Ken? It's apparently a dog emoji with an afro. Yeah, he's he's a little dog mascot that has all kinds of different funky hairstyles. The 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 typical one is some kind of afro. And it looks uh, like a rainbow afro. Yeah, so there's a rainbow afro, there's an afro that is basically like green with little apples in it, so it looks like a little apple tree. There's, you know, pink afros and there's all kinds of different colored <laughs> there's afros. There's a pompadour there's... and then there's a super pompadour. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So I owned a stuffed animal of the yellow pompadour blue dog version of this. <laughs> I bought this back in the early 2000s, I think, um, from, you know, some online retailer at the time. And I had it in my car. So anybody that would ever take a ride in my car, they one of the first things they would see is a blue dog with a yellow pompadour. So there you go. And apparently um, there's a wiener dog variation, too. <laughs> so this this dog is just it's so just you know random nonsensey kind of thing but I, I love it i love it and i don't think this is popular at all anymore like yeah, you don't never see it heard anymore. or seen of this <laughs> seen this yeah yeah so it was popular for a few years and then it kind of disappeared it was um san x was the uh, company that put it out and i think san x also put out um rirakuma which is still oh. quite popular yeah rirakuma is still pretty big yeah. Um, so, you know, they're, they're a well-known company. It's just, I guess, this character had its boom and then kind of faded away. Um, one thing that I found out was that there was a CG animation video put out. And it is like one of the weirdest things that I've seen lately. Um, it's just these, there's no narrative. It's just these different dogs with afros um, in weird situations. And there's a weird like English uh theme song and, and so yeah i will include the link to this if anybody wants to go down like an afro dog uh fever dream video rabbit hole um i i, I highly recommend it <laughs> uh, all right we'll take a quick break here and then we're going to talk about two more um actual uh dogs that existed and there's going to be some uh nationalist 
uh, droopy ear controversy. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, commercial time. So if you haven't already, make sure to follow or subscribe, whatever it is in your podcast app. I know things are not always the same across all podcast apps, but you know what I mean. Uh, that helps immensely with growing the show, boosting the rankings. Plus, it ensures that you don't miss any future episodes. So why not do that if you haven't already? And if you have, well, then I bow down to you, sir or madam. Thank you so much. <laughs> Seriously, I do appreciate it. Um, also, don't forget to follow on Facebook and Twitter at Japankyo News. If you're doing any shopping on Amazon, japankyo.com slash Amazon. That helps immensely. I know a few people have been using that link. And again, I seriously appreciate it. Every little bit helps. Um, you know, the, doing this stuff costs money and... Uh, <laughs> Let's just say I'm not breaking even, but hey, it is what it is. I enjoy doing it. Um, and don't forget to check out the latest episode of Japan Station. Uh, the latest episode is an interview with Mike Penny, who is a very, very talented and funny performer and composer of the Shamisen. Uh, stuff that he has done has appeared in the very popular PlayStation 4 game Ghosts of Tsushima. Um, and he also has a very fun project called MPO, Mike Penny Orchestra which, uh, well, it's kind of his place to experiment with the shamisen. Uh, He does a lot of like 80s synth pop blended together with the shamisen as well as other creative covers and and whatnot. So um, I really enjoyed talking to him. Go check out that episode. That is Japan Station episode 70. You can find it wherever you get your podcast or japanstationpodcast.com. More announcements coming very soon about some other non- japankyo.com stuff i mean there's one in particular that's coming very very soon uh and then hopefully another one that's coming in, I, I don't know soonish <laughs> but uh, i'll keep you guys posted on that more announcements coming very soon both uh here in the podcast feed over on the website and of course at japankyo news over on facebook and twitter all right let's get back to the doggies all right so back to the japanese doggies um, so first, uh, here we have, uh, Tsun, Tsun. So Tsun was Saigo Takamori's dog. So Saigo Takamori, in case you're not aware, um, perhaps one, uh, definitely one of the most famous figures from the 1800s of, uh, Japanese history. Uh, he is basically the inspiration for The Last Samurai, uh, because, um, you know, I mean, that's often how he's depicted. So basically what happened is, um, you know, he was kind of rebelling against uh, the Meiji Restoration uh, because, you know, he was protecting his Satsuma clan and kind of the way they were doing things. And that is a grossly oversimplified, you know, explanation. But um, eventually he gets his reputation uh, the whole like historical perspective gets rehabilitated and you know now he's kind of seen as this positive-ish historical hero sort of guy but it's a very interesting history but i I don't want to get too much into that uh because we got to talk about the dogs so again saigo takamori very very well known uh and he liked dogs apparently but according to you know the stories his favorite dog was a dog named tsun and in the depictions and descriptions of Sun from around the time, maybe, you know, within a few years after, or like there was one uh, artist that did a, a a painting, I guess, or maybe a woodblock print, I'm not sure, uh, that depicted Saigo Takamori with the dog. Um, so in, in basically all these records, you see that the dog has floppy ears. He looks a little bit like a, maybe like a Western-ish. Uh, yeah. I think there's one depiction that I, that I included in the notes, Ryan. What would you say? Uh... Looking for the description. I was looking at the picture. He definitely looks like some kind of European breed, like mm-hmm. Beagle-ish. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, one derogatory description that I saw was he looked kind of like a Chinese mongrel or something like that. So this was from the time, from people, because again, remember in the 1800s, 1900s, there was a lot of um, very nationalist sentiment going on. And so to to describe something as Chinese is usually not a positive thing at this time. Um, so, yeah, you you could say that the dog, Tsun, uh, looked kind of like a European breed or maybe like a Chinese breed because it had droopy ears. And typically Japanese dogs, uh, in those breeds, they have the very perky ears, right? They, they stand up. Yeah. So in 1898, they installed this statue. It's a very well-known statue in Ueno in Tokyo. 
Um, it's still there as far as I know. I, I, I don't remember having ever seen it myself, but I, I'm pretty sure it's still there. And, you know, it's a very well-known statue. And the dog, the, the statue shows Saigo Takamori with the dog Tsun. But when the statue was being created, um, the people behind the statue decided that they couldn't have the dog look European or Chinese with these droopy ears. So they insisted that the dog have these pointy vertical ears so that it looks more like a Japanese dog because Saigo Takamori is being rehabilitated into this Japanese hero during this time of nationalist sentiment. And so for him to have a European or Chinese looking dog just, you know, wouldn't vibe with that nationalist sentiment that was going on at the time. And uh, these people that were behind this historical revisionism uh, succeeded. And to this day, uh, that dog, that statue of the dog still has pointy ears. And, and Ryan, you were saying, what, what does this dog look like? You were looking at, at a picture of the statue. I'm going to take it back because there, there's more than one picture of it. And from a different view, it does look like a dog. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I will, right. I will well, throw out there, though, that mm -hmm. even the depiction of the guy himself looks very different from the other artist's like, painting of him. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, they removed his I facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there. I was reading that Saigo Takamori's wife um, was not all that in favor of some aspects of the uh, aesthetic choices that they made for the statues. So, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, when you <laughs> at this time, you know, they're they're using this as a kind of hero of Jap Japan and nationalism, all this stuff. So they want to depict him in a certain light. And so there were certain ideas that motivated these aesthetic decisions. And yeah, so, but anyway, the statue is still there. And just keep in mind that if you ever do see it, uh, the dog, uh, you know, one, one description that I saw, it looked kind of rabbit-like, um, but- It does have pointy ears. ears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just keep in mind that that is not historically accurate. Soon did not have pointy ears. Uh, Tsun had droopy ears, flappy ears. And Saigo Takamori would be outraged if he saw them get his favorite dog wrong. I know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you don't want to have people mess up your dog. Next yeah. episode, The Curse of Takamori. <laughs> the Curse of Takamori's Dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so next up, there's Hachiko, which I think pretty much everybody knows, but just in case uh, you don't know the story of Hachiko, um, Ryan, you want to just give a really brief summary the one that probably everybody knows and then we'll uh pick it apart a bit there was a dog named hachiko who would always meet his owner at the train station after work and like walk home with him i think it was a professor from a university and yep. eventually the professor died but the dog being a dog didn't know that and continued to go to the train station to wait for his owner who just never came yeah for like yeah, many yeah. many days yeah. Exactly, yeah. And so this became a very popular story. You know, they call uh, Hachiko uh, Chuken Hachiko in Japanese. Chuken means loyal dog. Uh, so, you know, it, it developed this uh, reputation of being, you know, an, an incredibly loyal dog that would wait for its owner there despite the owner never coming back. And it's this super emotional, you know, kind of sad, but also kind of inspiring story um, that has I been told. I think it's what inspired that Futurama episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's a very famous Futurama episode that so many people, you know, end up crying after they watch uh, because it, it's it's a great episode. But um, that is basically, yeah, that is what inspired it. Yes. Um, but, OK, there's a lot more to this story and, and a lot of aspects of this get left out. Um, I will point out two sources, two of the main sources that I used for this. Uh, one was this uh, TV show from Japan that seems to have aired maybe around the 90s. It was super bad quality on YouTube, but... Um, enough for me to actually be able to make out what was being said, thankfully. Um, I will include links to that if you want to watch that. And the other one is this book by Aaron Scabaland. It's called uh, Empire of Dogs. And it's a whole um, like 300, 400 page history of um, dogs in the modern like Edo and Meiji period. And, and theme. it deals with themes of imperialism and nationalism. And uh, it's a very, very interesting book. And so there was a lot of really good information in there. So let's uh, let's start at the beginning then. So uh, Hachiko uh, is said to have been born in uh, November of 1923. 
it's disputed whether it was November 10th or November 20th or maybe November 14th. Uh, but anyway, you know, there's a discrepancy there, but it was in November of, um, 1923 um it was born in this uh i think it was like a farm uh in odate uh around odate city in akita prefecture um so keep that in mind little baby hachiko cute baby hachiko is born in november oh oh exactly yeah yeah so uh then we're gonna go over to tokyo so there is this professor. Uh, he works in the agricultural department at the then uh, Tokyo Imperial University, uh, which is now Tokyo University. Uh, and uh, he worked there and he wanted a dog. He already had at least one dog, but he heard something about Japanese dogs, I think. And, you know, for some reason he wanted a Japanese dog. So he reached out to a former student of his. And that former student of his was uh, the owner of uh Hachiko and the parents of Hachiko. And so the former student of his sends Hachiko by train uh, and Hachiko arrives in uh, Shibuya about, I think it was about 50 days after uh, Hachiko was born. So that was uh, around January of the following year, 1924. I'm imagining him making this train trip alone with like a little backpack with all his gear inside, which is just like his bowl. <laughs> it has got, got a train ticket. In <laughs> yeah, his yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, um so all right so he arrives and apparently from the first day you know the the, the professor and uh, hachiko were inseparable and uh this is according to that japanese tv show uh, hachiko ended up sleeping uh, with uh the professor that night and uh it was just you know delightful and, and wonderful as all things with dogs are yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, as as Hachiko grows up a bit, then Hachiko starts to accompany the professor on his way to uh, work, right? Which is at the uh, agricultural department of, again, the now Tokyo University at the uh, Komaba campus. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how many campuses Tokyo University has. So, but anyway, the, the video said Komaba. Um, so uh, he would... I think walk to uh, the the university and then Hachiko would go along and then at the gate they would part ways and then Hachiko would at in the evening wait for him at the gate. I don't know what Hachiko would do during the day. Maybe Hachiko would walk around and you know look for food or something. But um, in the evening, Scavenged. supposedly, <laughs> he, he, well, that's what dogs do. <laughs> Well, I mean, when I walk my dog, like, it's always, what, the second it finds something remotely food-like, it tries to take it. <laughs> I just, like, when you explain it like that from the, it sounds like he wasn't a very good owner. He just left his dog on the street for, like, 10 hours a day. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's what every story says. And, and um, I mean, back then, there were, the rules for dogs were, like, nothing like they were now. It was, like, dogs are just roaming around everywhere, it seems, so. No leash that, laws, that, no, that, no owner being accompanying with the laws. I mean, yeah, it seems like that. It, it seems like there were no penalties for it. So uh, it's definitely not like that these days. Maybe Hachiko but, uh, worked like Arubaito at a, at a combi or something. <laughs> yeah, a little part-time. You know what i So the story goes that when he would leave his, his you know, work would be done in the evening, Hachiko would be waiting for him there. And they would walk back home together. Now, what what about the train station? So the story always goes like, oh, he would always accompany him to the train station, right? But no, actually, it seems that most of the time, Hachiko would accompany him to the university, but only sometimes to this train station. And those times were when um, the professor, his name, by the way, is, uh, I think, Hide Saburo Ueno, Ueno, Professor Ueno. So Professor Ueno would sometimes have to go to, like, government offices. He would have to, you know, go somewhere else for work purposes. And on those days, he would go to Shibuya Station. So on those days, Hachiko would apparently also wait for him to come back. And uh, sometimes the professor would take Hachiko uh, with him to, uh, you know, he would have a drink after work, maybe to like a, a, a yakitori place. And sometimes... See our yakitori episode. Go, go, <laughs> yeah, go listen to our, hachi, our, our yakitori episode, um, which is skewered chicken, by the way. No, no don't explain it. They have uh, to watch the episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have to listen to the whole thing. It's like an hour of 
incredible yakitori content. I, I do think it's good content. The but, best yakitori um, podcast ever made. <laughs> yep. I, I, hey, I stand by that. The best right? I've ever been involved uh, with. <laughs> same here. Same here. <laughs> So, uh, the, the Japanese TV show that I was watching about this said that sometimes, you know, the professor would give uh, Hachiko a little bit of yakitori as well. And uh, back then, I mean, nowadays, uh, Shibuya Station is, you know, has been developed. <laughs> it's yeah. totally different from how it was back then. But back then, apparently, there were uh, food stalls, it seems. So, uh, I guess some of these food stalls were also yakitori places or they sold yakitori. So anyway, the the professor, you know, would sometimes go to work and blah, blah, blah. And then they would come back and sometimes at the train station and, and Hachiko would get yakitori or whatever, little treats. And then one day, uh, Hachiko goes to wait for the professor at the school. All right. So this is what the Japanese TV show said at the school, at the gate. But the professor didn't come out because the professor had collapsed and I, he had had some, I think it was like a cerebral hemorrhage or something. I don't remember exact the exact cause of death, but he ends up dying. And so Hachiko is there at the gate, but, you know, they never sees the, the master again. According to one thing that I was reading, uh, Hachiko didn't want to eat for three days after that. So, um, again, I don't know if every single thing of that, that I'm saying is totally true. I, I can only relate to the best of my ability, you know, what seems to be true and what others have said, because there's a lot, at some point, somebody comes into the story and really starts to try to shape it. And so, you know, we can't piece apart every single little thing that, you know, what, whether it was true or not. But anyway, um, so what happens is, you know, the, the, the professor dies and uh, the, the um, how can I put it? Um, he was living with a woman that was not technically his wife. Her name is Yaeko. Um, Yae is what most sources call her. And uh, because they didn't get married because uh, the professor's uh, father uh, objected to the marriage because the professor's father wanted him to marry a local person from where he was from. But anyway, they, they live together and they're, you know, they're basically living as, as uh, uh, you know, husband and wife. And uh, unfortunately, after he passes away, she has to move out. I guess she can't afford the house anymore. So she has to move away uh, to somewhere smaller. Uh, and she can't keep uh, Hachiko because Akita dogs are not small dogs, right? So she, she can't keep it in a small place, wherever it is that she went. Um, and so she uh, contacts uh, a former student of uh, the professor and she says, um, hey, can you uh, keep the dog you know can you keep Hachiko because I, I can't keep him anymore and so he agrees and uh, this is in Asakusa so the guy lives in Asakusa and uh, he keeps the dog for a while oh and by the way um, the professor and Hachiko only lived together for about one one year four months yeah the dog was only so, two yeah yeah so it was still young dog not that long with the professor but um, you know the professor passed away and, and so then uh, Yae sends Hachiko to uh, the former student in Asakusa. And it's at this point where Hachiko starts to escape, I guess, at night and uh, travels back to the old house in Shibuya and uh, presumably, you know, wishing to uh, meet the professor again, right? Or go back to the old uh, territory, right? Because, of course, dogs think in kind of that way, like this is where it was and so wants to go back to where it was. Um and so it starts escaping at night, which is apparently about 15 kilometers. Uh, so that's like, what, six, seven miles, maybe? Pretty far. Yeah, that is pretty far. So, yeah, it walks quite a distance. And uh, eventually what happens is they decide, um, you know, that if the dog wants to go be in that area, then maybe they should find somebody that lives in the area. So they, Yae, the the kind of wife, but not technically wife. Um, she talks to uh, the former gardener of the house of the professor where they were living and because he still lives near Shibuya. And she asks him, can you take care of the dog? And he, you know, gladly apparently says yes and starts taking care of the dog. And so at this point, that's when you, I think, you know, you really start to see uh, the, the, the part of the story where uh, Hachiko starts to go to the train station. At this point, we get uh, this other guy enters the story, and his name is uh, Saito Hirokichi. So uh, this guy, he's uh, a guy active 
uh, in an effort to preserve Japanese dogs, Japanese dog breeds. One of the most noble the, things a person can do. Yeah, no, we we love dogs. Um, Hachiko, all dogs, love them, love them. Um, and, and, you know, an effort to preserve dogs, wonderful. So he, he's, you know, he makes it his kind of life's work to, to work with kind of preserving dogs. Um, now, I will preface this with... He himself admits that in the 1930s, especially, he had some nationalistic, ultra-nationalistic tendencies. Um, and some of this will shape, apparently, um, some of his approach towards the way the, the story of Hachiko uh, gets told. Now, that being said, um, in 1929, around that time, he's traveling around Japan trying to find um, examples of like pure breed Japanese dogs because they were kind of dying off and, and disappearing and he wanted to preserve them and he was the founder of um, a Japanese dog like preservation society um, and at some point he uh, encounters in, in I guess in, Shi in Shibuya you know the dog right the Hachiko and uh, he writes something up in his newsletter for his organization and uh, about the story of, of Hachiko and he leaves it at that a few years later it seems that he realizes that he can use this story to help raise awareness of Hachiko and the Akita breed. Um, and so he contacts somebody in the Asahi newspaper and they publish a story. And uh, from there you start to get, you know, that's where the canon of Hachiko is really born. Um, and like, it just blows up, right? People go crazy for Hachiko. Like the story of Hachiko spreads around the world and it gets translated into English and, and people just go crazy for this loyal dog and this tragic story of the dog, you know, staying uh, at the station night and day. Well, not maybe during the day, you know, every day rain and in the wind and in the snow, you know, waiting for the master that will never come. And, um, Eventually, what happens is they, they decide, or well, the, the frenzy gets to a point where, um, of course, they're selling merchandise and, you know, it's, it's just a, a total frenzy for Hachiko everything. And somebody decides to do a wooden sculpture of, of Hachiko and then Saito gets involved and then says, no, let's do this. And he uh, ends up being the guy that puts forth the original bronze statue of Hachiko. And here we get a little bit of controversy in that generally... You know, and, and the, the records show that the photos, because there are photos of Hachiko, show that Hachiko had a droopy left ear. And other records show that Hachiko had, did not normally, you didn't see Hachiko have the really upright curly tail, vertical kind of curly tail that is characteristic of the Akita breed. And it seems that Saito really wanted to hide this because he kept, you know, pushing that this was a purebred Akita dog. And even in the original um, Asahi newspaper article, it said that it was a mixed Akita breed dog. And Saito really seems to have disliked that. He has betrayed uh, because, his calling. He's not preserving dogs if he's making lies about them. All dogs are great, <laughs> even if they're mixed. <laughs> exactly. I, I totally agree. Yes, yes, yes. And the reality is that there were a lot of mixed Akita dogs. Um, they were, for a while, they were breeding, I think it's called like the Shin Akita. That was a mixed Akita breed. Um, and, and, new Akita? But, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, and, and let's be perfectly clear here, you know, breeds, they're basically a human fabrication. And the whole idea of a purebred is also kind of like a dubious concept. But yeah. anyway. We'll put that aside for now. Um, the point is here that when the when it came time to build the statue, he wanted the sculptor to depict Hachiko with two pointy ears. All right, but the sculptor did not. He it seems that he stuck to his guns, and we got left droopy ear Hachiko as the original statue. Go statue man! Yay! So <laughs> accurate depiction of Hachiko. Okay. Um, and, and so again, just to be clear, you know, the, these, the droopy ear to Saito was, could be interpreted as uh, the fact that, uh, Hachiko was very likely not quote unquote, a pure Akita breed, right? And he didn't want that. He wanted to, uh, use the story of Hachiko to promote purebred Akita dogs. So anyway, we get into World War II. So this is, this all happened before World War II. We get into World War II and in 1944, um, what, what happened was there was of course a metal shortage and they decided to melt down Hachiko, uh, the story, uh, the, the, the statue of Hachiko. 
And uh, in the ceremony, because there was a big ceremony, they draped it in the rising uh, sun flag and everything. Um, and they said that they were going to melt it down for like bullets. That did not happen. They ended up melting down the statue for train parts. <laughs> so I will say if there's one thing dogs hate, it's war. So melting down a dog statue <laughs> for bullets is just the t- most terrible thing. Yes, yes. But uh, hey, it ended up being train parts. So, dogs like yay. trains. They just hate war. Yeah, dog. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Hachiko's life really seems to have revolved around trains, you know, train station. It was sent on a train, and then the original bronze statue ended up becoming train parts. So, Hachiko had a link with uh, a destiny with trains. So, all right. So, we have the statue. The original statue disappears. And by the way, the original statue was in a slightly different location than where the current statue is. But, um, of course, like I said, there's a current statue that came back. It's a very, very famous statue. It's known as, like, the meeting place that you you go to in, in Shibuya, right? When you meet your friends, you meet them at Hachiko Station. Or not Hachiko Station. Hachiko statue at Shibuya Station. I'm going to point out as a um, person who did that, that place is so crowded. You should not use it as your meeting place. Pick like a I not agree. crowded place nearby. I agree. I agree. It's always freaking. It's a horrible place to meet people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so uh, in uh, 1948, I think it was like uh, August, right? 1948. Yes. Uh, they, they reinstall, they reinaugurate a new version of the statue. Um, and apparently, uh, there was um, somebody that was involved with the, with people uh, from abroad coming to Japan in these post-war years. I assume they were probably well-connected people if they were going to Japan at that time. Uh, and they would ask like, oh, where's that statue of Hachiko, of that dog? And the, the statue wasn't there, right? Because it would have been melted down. And so that guy ended up talking to um, Saito Hirokichi. And uh, that eventually led to the, you know, funding of a new statue. They got donations and they uh, rebuilt the statue. But even at this point, Saito really wanted the new sculptor, which I I think was the son of the original sculptor, um, to not do the droopy left ear, to do like two vertical ears. But the the sculptor decided to be loyal to the original statue and, uh, you know, decided to go with the droopy left ear so yay and thus ends the story of saito hirokichi the worst dog preserver ever (laughs) i mean uh, what i what i will say and in the book empire of dogs which really discusses is a lot more in depth so if you want to go check that out japanko.com slash amazon affiliate link Uh, but um it says that you know this guy you know he, he of course he did do a lot for the dog you know world now and and saito hirokichi himself admits that he had some, you know, nationalist tendencies and maybe his motivations were, uh, um, consciously or unconsciously, uh, uh, influenced by the nationalist tendency at the time. Uh, but you know, you know, yes, he did do good stuff, but also some of the decisions that he made, uh, helped link this idea of certain dogs with the whole nationalist rhetoric going at the time. So good and bad. No, no excuses. Dogs come before nation. Mm. (laughs) I agree. I agree. So anyway, so uh, one interesting thing that the book Empire of Dogs points out is that there was this big ceremony for the new statue. And uh, according to the story uh, presented there, um, <laughs> there was a a grandson of, uh, of um, Hachiko that was supposed to be in attendance. By that point, Hachiko had passed away already. Um, so the grandson of Hachiko, one of the grandsons of Hachiko was supposed to be there. His name was Tetsu, but before the ceremony, Tetsu disappeared. And eventually they came to find out that uh, he had been used as the protein for sukiyaki. So, um, somebody had eaten him or several people had eaten the grandson of Hachiko before he could attend the ceremony. Used as the Uh, protein? That's what, that's how the book phrases it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so you know this is a story and, and I, I i it seemed like it was a factual thing but I, I will you know that check out the book for all the nuance but um the the an important thing to point out is that this is basically you know the just a couple years after the end of the war during and in the years immediately following the war there was a lot of food shortages and a lot of people in really really dire straits so um eating dog was something that would happen 
and apparently it happened in this situation. So there you go. For the record, though, it's not normal in Japanese society to eat dog. This is a extreme circumstance. Yeah, yeah. People yeah. back then probably were also upset, but it was an no, extreme no, no. Yeah, circumstance, yeah. lack of food kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So nowadays, I mean, dogs are just beloved. You would never, never hear of anything like this. So, so um, as for Hachiko, what, what happens is, um, you know, Hachiko get, passes away and, of course, you know, very sad. Um, and and um, he gets uh, taxidermied. I don't know if that's a proper verb, but it is now. Um, they, <laughs> they skin it and they, they take the body and they in, interrogate it. They bury it with the master in in um. I think he was in in the Aoyama Cemetery. Yeah, Aoyama Cemetery. Um, and uh, so he gets to return with the master. They take the skin and they mount it and they stuff it. And uh, as far as I know, it's still at the uh, Tokyo uh, Science Museum. I think the Kokuritsu Kagaku Hakubutsukan, something like that, um, which is also in Tokyo. So uh, along with um, one of those Taro and Jiro, I forget which one. So um, it's probably still there. Now in the in the taxidermy version, though, they did make the ear stand up. Um, so oh, boo that guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so in that Japanese TV show, they say that the ear drooping and the tail drooping was due to a skin condition that uh, Hachiko developed uh, later on. But in Empire of Dogs, that doesn't come up and it really seems like that was just something that was always part of uh, Hachiko. So uh, I'm more inclined to believe um, Aaron uh, Scalid, Scalund. I, I, I'm sorry, I forgot the last name, but um, because, you know, this is an academically researched, you know, peer reviewed book and there's a lot of citations there. So I'm, I'm far more inclined to believe him. But anyway, just know that Hachiko had a droopy left ear. That is a fact. And it is undisputed. Yes, 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 yes. And he was a good boy. And he was a very, very good boy. Yes. So as for the cause of death, um, it seems like um, Hachiko had worms. Um, also, Hachiko was up there in years. Um, I think it was like 12 years old, roughly. Um, and uh, also, it seems that Hachiko may have had cancer. Um, and this is not said to be a direct cause of death. This is not attributed with having caused Hachiko's death, but um, the taxidermist is said to have found four skewers of, of yakitori, like the sticks, um, in his stomach. He ate them whole? <laughs> I guess. I'm assuming that Hachiko like, just chewed them down so that it was like, you know, broken mm. sticks. Because, I mean, to swallow a whole stick, I mean, that's pretty bad. Um, he was hungry that day. But yeah, I guess so. But according to the English language Wikipedia, um, the the skewers are not said to have caused any internal damage. So that's why I think that Hachiko probably chewed on the sticks before swallowing them. So that brings me to uh, Tony's Hachiko theory. All right. So this is based on everything I read. I did read a Japanese article that that suggested this as well. But, you know, the, the reality is that you know, whether it's your own dog or Hachiko, we all, we can't help but um, assign kind of human qualities and emotions to dogs. And I love dogs and I do that myself. But, you know, sometimes we read a bit more into their actions and, and then, you know, may actually be there. The, the, the reality is that that was to Hachiko its territory. And Hachiko would get food, right? Apparently it would get, you know, yakitori. And once this story really blew up, especially, people would bring gifts to Hachiko and, and Hachiko would get like treats and food. So, you know, was Hachiko simply waiting for the master that would never come? Or was Hachiko maybe initially just, you know, that, that became, it's, it, it was conditioned to do that. And then it got positive reinforcement through the food that it would get when it would go to Shibuya Station, I mean, I'm, I'm more inclined to uh, side with that theory than it was some simple, pure uh, loyalty kind of thing, right? So, obviously, it enjoyed yakitori, and people would give it stuff, and it became a celebrity, and of course, people kept giving it more and more stuff. So, 
yeah, like, of course it's going to go every day to get some food, right? So, yeah, I think it's not simply just the human thing, but also it would get food. I don't right? see this as exclusive. I think if his master showed up again, he'd still be happy, but he'd also keep going for yakitori. I agree. I agree. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no. I mean, wh- when you come home and your dog is there, like, you know, wagging its tail and everything, obviously it, it's, it feels some sort of, I mean, we can call it happiness, right? To see you. So yeah, I think Hachiko, like there were stories that Hachiko would still remember, for example, the yae, right? The, the mm. kind of wife. Uh, and so would be very happy when it would see uh, yae. So I think that it would probably remember the professor too. So yeah, there was that. And then of course, you know, if it's getting food every day, then that's further positive reinforcement to really keep it there. So um, Hachiko liked yakitori. Um, so I think it was... Until his grandson was made into yakitori. <laughs> well, it was sukiyaki. Actually, oh, sukiyaki, so. sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's <yeah>. right. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so his, yeah. his love of yakitori at least remained pure. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, Never eat sukiyaki again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and unfortunately, there, there's the other aspect, which, of course, Hachiko's story got kind of, maybe even, maybe not explicitly, but implicitly to some extent, you know, um, utilized by the whole kind of nationalist rhetoric that was going on at the time. And it, it, it became used in, like, Japanese textbooks and... and um clumped in with other stories kind of indoctrinating uh you know the youth of the time to you know be loyal to the country and etc et this would be so, in a textbook yeah there was the story of hachiko ended up in a textbook in the like japanese national textbooks yeah. wow i do yeah. gotta say like i'm against all the nationalism propaganda stuff but i do mm-hmm. like that the final result if that was their purpose like modern day japan nobody takes the story to mean that they're just like dogs are cool and that's like the only yeah 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 that's yeah. the only moral I mean, nowadays, story <laughs> no he's just you know it's a dog that loved its master and there you go yeah yep and uh oh yeah and then there was a in 2009 there was an american movie made called hachi uh something a dog story or something yeah. like that. and it stars richard gear yay richard yeah Gere. i was here when that came out here and it was really weird yeah, yeah. I I had a friend that would enjoy mimicking Richard Gere saying Hachi. <laughs> I never saw it, but I just remember thinking like this is an incredibly well-known Japanese story that you remade outside of Japan but then released in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. I'm sure Japanese people were had very mixed feelings about it. Uh I I'm mean, guessing all I the pro that's... war stuff was removed. <laughs> Yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it wasn't, and it's a very strange movie. Well, apparently it takes place in Rhode Island, so I don't know how they would fit in nationalist Japanese sentiment into a story that takes place in Rhode Island, but you never know. <laughs> I hope he at least gets some um, yakitori at some point. <laughs> All right, so one last thing that is not related directly to any of these uh, dogs, but... As I was reading Empire of Dogs, um, I came across this one little tidbit that I absolutely loved. Um, so back in the day, maybe like Meiji period, um, maybe late Edo period, um, you know, you had foreigners coming to Japan with their foreign dogs. And uh, apparently, <laughs> due to that, the, the popular theory is that due to that, you ended up with Kame or Kame Inu being a new term for dogs in Japanese. <laughs> and Kame normally would mean turtle in Japanese, right? Yeah. So how do we end up with Kame meaning dog in Japanese? Well, the popular theory is that these foreigners bringing their foreign dogs to Japan, they would tell their dogs, come here, come here, come here. And the Japanese that heard this they would hear it as something like kameya or something along those lines. And then kameya got shortened to kame inu or just kame. And so they possibly thought that that meant dog in English or <laughs> in whatever language. Maybe it was Dutch people they were talking. You know, I, I don't know. No, I guess it was, I don't, it was come here. It was English. Yeah, it was. So, <laughs> not yeah. English speakers were using English to communicate with their dogs. Because dogs <laughs> yeah, only so, speak English, ancient Japanese, and Sanskrit. That's true. That's true. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So it was English um, or Sanskrit. <laughs> or Sanskrit. It could have been that. They're yeah. proficient in those three. So again, the popular theory is that come here turned into kame ya or something, and then that turned into kame, kame inu. Now, I think pretty much nobody in Japan knows this anymore, like unless you're some super like language nerd. Uh, but 
kame at some point meant dog in Japanese. So uh, th- that's it for today. Uh, go go pet a dog. Go, yes, please go, pet a go dog. Tell a dog that's yeah. your homework yeah. for today. Yes, <laughs> and give one yakitori. <laughs> yeah, get, get, yeah, yeah. No, d- take this. Take it off the skewer. Yes, yes. Right? Don't feed the skewer. They don't. Yeah, and most don't, of them don't like. Give the it without. Yeah, no salt, no salt. You don't want too much sodium, so you know, just just the meat, just nice grilled meat. All right, see you next time. See ya.